those videos that we just uh, showed you are just a little uh, bit of a, of a teaser as to the kinds of things that we do at the Borlaug Institute of the Texas A&M University system. Um, those were some of our projects. The first one, the Guatemala Coffee Project, where we are looking to uh, for varieties of coffee that are resistant to coffee rust. Um, we also just ended a, a project in Rwanda where we looked at uh, producing, helping smallholder farmers pr produce pyrethrum flowers from which uh, natural insecticide could be removed and uh, sold to SC Johnson. And so that whole idea of uh, entering a value chain, we have learned that has worked better than anything uh, in terms of lifting smallholder farmers out of poverty and hunger. So um, I wanted then this afternoon to, uh, to uh, invite you to Finish your lunch and, and grab some coffee and, and some dessert because you are in for a treat. Um, our luncheon speaker this afternoon is Dr. Pamela Anderson, um, who uh, holds a, a BA degree in biology from Northwestern University, an MSc in entomology from the University of Illinois. And I know Dr. Easter is, is in the room, so he'll be pleased to, to hear that. Um, an MSc in human ecology and a doctorate in science in population sciences and vector entomology from the Harvard School of Public Health. Well, she has had, Dr. Anderson has had a very distinguished career and has worked um, for decades um, in Latin America, including 12 years with the Universidad Nacional Agraria in Nicaragua. She uh, served as a senior entomologist and coordinator of the Tropical Whitefly IPM program at one of the uh, CGIAR centers, the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, CIAT, in Colombia from 96 to 2002. From 2002 to 2005, she was um, uh, director of research. And then from 05 to 2013, she served as director general of that same um, center, the International Potato Center in Lima, Peru, uh, which is one of the research centers uh, of this consultative group on international agriculture research, CGIAR. Um, she has been an advisor to, uh, to various groups and task forces. She also uh, served as director for the agriculture development program of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation where she led the team that works to reduce hunger and poverty for farming families in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And uh, she has been serving also as a member of the Board for International Food and Agriculture Development, which is a, a presidentially appointed um, position that advises the administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development. So as I said, we are in for a treat. Uh, this is someone who has worked lived in those countries, who has had a tremendous amount of um, perspective from all that experience that she has, she has gained, and I know that she's going to share that with us. So please help me give a warm welcome to uh, Dr. Pamela Anderson. Thank you. Damas y caballeras, muy buenas tardes. I can't bring myself to say howdy, sorry. Um, I, I want to thank Elsa Morano and Julie Borlaug and the Borlaug Institute for the invitation to be here with you. Um, it's a real honor, um, and I'm really enjoying already and look forward to the rest of our summit. This summit is a particular delight to join into. Central America has a very special place in my heart and in my history. When I made a decision as a sophomore in college that I was going to work in development through the lens of food security, the first trip that I took overseas was to Costa Rica for a field biology course that turned into nine months. That's where I started to learn Spanish and that's where I fell in love with Central America. After I went to Ecuador to do my master's research there, I came back and as Elsa said, I spent 12 years living in Nicaragua and working at the National Agricultural University there. Um, I then fell in love with a tall, dark, handsome Colombian, and I moved to Colombia and started working with SEAT, but continued the work in Central America 
on whiteflies and Gemini viruses and had my own research in El Salvador in Zapotitan. Um, so the first half of my career was very, very much aligned with the work in Central America. When I moved to Lima to start working with the International Potato Center, my geographical focus shifted to the Andean countries, but many of the challenges were the same kinds of challenges. Um, and I just need to make a comment um, because I'm a little bit accelerada. Today is a really good day to be um, the Director General Emeritus of the International Potato Center. While we have been here hosted by the Borlaug Institute, in Washington this morning, they've been making some important announcements. Three of the SIP scientists have just been named as 2016 World Food Laureates for our work on orange flesh sweet potato. Along with Howdy Buis, it's, it's very exciting. Along with Howdy Buis, who's been the director of Harvest Plus. So the whole area of biofortification is getting recognized this year. So that's really wonderful. Now, I'm wondering where my slides are. Do I have to push something? There it is, okay. So what I'd like to do this afternoon is make a few introductory comments and then focus on three principal areas. Targeting, sustainability, and accountability. These are areas where I believe if we can intensify our investments, financial investments, political investments, and intellectual investments, we have a good chance of accelerating progress towards that viable future. And I don't think you're going to be surprised. A lot of the comments that I will have to make are going to echo and underline points that have already come up this morning. This is one of our new mantras. The United Nations tells us that by the middle of the century, the planet will have 9.7 billion people, and we are going to need to increase our food production by 70%. If you can see this, the Global Gap Report of 2015, produced by the Global Harvest Initiative in Washington, has depicted the dimension of that challenge by region. So what they're projecting out is that Sub-Saharan Africa in 30 years, in 15 years, will only be producing 14% of the food that it needs. Asia will be doing better. South and Southeast Asia will be producing 74% of the food it needs. East Asia, 78%. But interestingly, they project that Latin America will be producing 117% of the food that it needs. In other words, within the next 15 years, Latin America is expected to become a net producer and exporter of food. And if we go back to the 2008 World Bank World Development Report, which focused on agriculture, what they argued is that there are actually three worlds of agriculture. We have the African economies, which are still agriculturally based. We have the Asian economies, which are transforming economies, and we have the Latin American economies, which are urbanized countries, and not necessarily with agriculture as a driver of economic and structural transformation, was their argument. Now, the problem with these data and these argument is that they're based over aggregated data. We know that it's primarily the southern cone that is going to increase productivity tremendously. Um, we really need to dig in and start disaggregating the data within country. This is part of the reason that we've seen a lot of the international actors and players moving their money out of agriculture or out of Latin America altogether. It has been exceedingly difficult over the last decade to 15 years to get money dedicated to agricultural and research development for Latin America. So we need to get smarter with our arguments. And the first proposition I would like to put forward with that respect is one of the critical things we need to do a better job at is targeting. Geographical targeting, but also targeting our vulnerable populations. Um, why? The World Bank and UNICEF tells us that Latin America is the region with the highest degree of economic inequity. This is a map of Gini coefficients. Gini coefficients are basically a measure of income distribution across a population, and it's used as a measure of inequity. So you can see that these darker red numbers, which are the higher figures indicating inequity, is what depicts Latin America. 
within the Northern Triangle, all three countries have been classified by the World Bank as middle income countries. They have a positive GDP growth, but you can see that the Gini coefficients are still really quite high. So one of the big messages, again, echoing some of the comments this morning, there will be no viable future without inclusive economic development. It's not just about economic development, it's about inclusive economic development. So we need within country to really identify and actively target the sub-national areas that are vulnerable. That's what Feed the Future has actually been doing. It's a new approach in its 19 target countries. So as an example, I took Honduras, and what you can see is that in 2010, 13% of the population was under the $1.25 a day poverty line. But if you take a look at the zone of influence, so the, the target in each of the Feed the Future countries are these areas called zones of influence. The target are these six departments in the western part of Honduras. If you look at the poverty level there, you've got three times more people living in extreme poverty. That means we need to dig in and really focus on and make investments in this poverty pocket. The other thing besides targeting within country to really understand what our map of vulnerability is, is we need to specifically look at vulnerable populations. Children, youth, and women. The 2015 Global Nutrition Report, and we heard this this morning, said that in 2015 we had 7.3 billion people on the planet, and of those people, 794 are calorie deficient. They go to bed hungry every night. Two billion are micronutrient deficient. In other words, they're missing vitamin A, zinc, iron, calcium. This is what they just gave the World Food Prize for, basically using foods as a solution to micronutrient deficiency. This is a huge problem. But we also still have 161 million children that are stunted. And we now understand, we have the science to understand what that means in development terms. We know that if a child reaches its second birthday and it is two standard deviations below the normal height for its age, that child will never be able to realize its full intellectual potential and its full physical capacity. So this little girl basically will never reach her full intellectual and physical potential. That's a loss for her, that's a loss for her family, her community, and her nation. This is what it looks like in the, southern, in the Northern Triangle. Um, if we look at the last two decades, stunting, and these are figures taken from the 2015 uh, synthesis by the Global Hunger Index, El Salvador has done an amazing job, really, of getting its child stunting down. Honduras has more than cut it in half. Guatemala is still struggling, but I understand that the government has just launched a zero hunger plan, which is really, really good news and, and very important in this context. If we disaggregate that further, we see that the figure right now for national stunting in Honduras is 22%. But if you again go to the zone of influence, you've got 38% of the children under five that are stunted. This is the figure for national stunting in Honduras a decade ago. So what it really means is that this zone is lagging behind in social progress, lagging a decade behind in social progress with respect to the rest of the country. Again, a reason for really digging in. Um, if we look at Honduras, 44% of the children nationwide are stunted. This is the real concern. If you look at the Western Highlands, which this is the zone of influence for Feed the Future in Guatemala, 67% of the children are stunted. That means that in almost 10% of the population, three quarters of your children will never reach their full intellectual and physical capacity. So that's a real loss of human asset if we're thinking about viable futures. And we know what drives malnutrition and child stunting. Food is an important factor. We know that there's a 1,000 day window from the time a woman gets pregnant to the second birthday of the child they must have a nutrient-dense 
diet during those 1,000 days so that child hits its proper height for age. Sanitation. We now understand the role that water, in particular, water sanitation plays in childhood stunting. Women's empowerment, which I will talk about in a minute. But look at the load, look at the contribution of female education. 43% contributor to child stunting. This is a stu oops, no, there. This is a study done by PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization. Um, look at the case of Guatemala. This is actually data for 2002, sorry. What this says is that if a woman is not educated at all, 70% of the children will be stunted. That sounds very similar to the figure that we just heard for the Western Highlands. If you get a primary education, the stunting level drops down to 50%. Secondary education, 25%. If women have higher educations, you're really looking at a stunting of less than 10%. So this is a tremendously important component, female education. So identifying and really focusing in on childhood stunting, I would argue strongly, is one of the most important investments that a country needs to make in terms of a viable future. We also need to focus on the youth. These are the United Nations 2015 population data. They show us right now in Latin America, 40% of the population is under 25. In 2011, IFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, the governing council, convened a meeting of rural youth um, in conjunction with their annual governing council meeting. The delegation from Latin America listed these six challenges as the challenges that they, the young people, felt that they were really facing. The first one was, they said, our institutions and communities don't recognize and pay enough attention to us. They felt like the invisible population. They said there's a rural-urban dichotomy that assumes if you live in the countryside, what you are going to do is become a farmer. And they want much more diverse opportunities than just going into farm. They said we have a lack of assets. We don't have access to land, to capital, to credit, to technical assistance. And if they are farming, they have a limited access to market. They also said we're not being integrated into the development programs, which is very true. We have done a poor job of targeting youth in our development programs systematically. And we also have limited access to training and education that's appropriate for agriculture. Last week I participated in a USAID webinar on civil security, food security, and violence in Central America. This was one of the slides shared by Karen Towers of USAID. Um, it, it really was alarming. It says from this 2016 study that 40%, 40% of the children in Latin America are dropping out of school by the age of 10 or 11. So you basically have over a third of your children who are not going on to secondary school because of the opportunity cost. They can't afford it or they need to work to contribute to the family because the schools are too far away or for girls it's often because they have household duties or early pregnancy and early marriage. So here you have a confluence of poverty, lack of education, lack of opportunity and violence that's driving young people into the cities and as we heard this morning, out of the countries. And again, you've got an entire generation there that becomes at risk in terms of being productive contributors to the viable future that we're trying to build. The other critical population that we really need to target is women. Um, for many of this, this has been a very frustrating area. Gender for the last two decades has been a soundbite. People talk about the importance of it. We know that women are prominent and important in agriculture. The data are indeed crystal clear that if income goes into the pocket of a woman, it will get spent on improving the education of her children, improving the diet of the family, improving the nutrition and overall well-being of the family. But we haven't understood gender well enough, and, and by gender I mean both the roles of men and women in agriculture. We haven't understood it well enough to translate that into strategies and tactics. You know, so what do we do about it? 
So it's been very exciting that, again, as part of the Feed the Future program, in 2011, USAID funded a collaboration with Oxford University and IFPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute in Washington. Um, we've had enough data and information accumulating that it was suggesting there are five domains that are critical if we're serious about empowering women. These five domains are decision making. One, does a woman have a say in what gets planted, where it gets planted on the farm, how it gets planted? Access to resources, does she have access to land, to credit, to technical assistance, to labor, to seeds, to fertilizers? Really important, does she have control or agency over her income? If she's getting income, can she control how it's used? Community leadership, does she have space, does she have a voice in the community? And does she have time to actually dedicate to agriculture? So this is a huge step forward to really try and tackle this in a way that we can measure and learn from it. The pilot was done in Bangladesh, Uganda, and Guatemala. These are the headline conclusions from Guatemala. Again, looking at the Western Highlands, the conclusion was only about 23% of the women there can be considered as empowered. And what they said is that the primary drivers are no space to participate in the community, no control over their income, and no access to resources. So it's, I think, tremendously important, again, in terms of targeting. And, and Dr. Osorio said this morning, you know, this is one of the places that we need to really go. Understanding the vulnerable areas within the country, digging in in those areas, and then really focusing on the vulnerable populations, children, youth, and women. If we do not take a more socially inclusive approach to this problem, we're probably going to continue having the same kind of results that we're frustrated with right now. The second area that I want to talk a little bit about is sustainability. Um, this is one of those words that has been so overused, it's become fuzzy. So when I say sustainability in this context, what I mean is continual progress, continuity and continual progress, which is important if we're talking about investments. I think many of us in this room have been witness to or responsible for developing projects and programs that are brilliant while the money's there, but the minute the resources stop, everything collapses and implodes. Because we haven't thought it through, we haven't come up with a end game or an exit strategy, who is going to take this over and keep building on the investments from the projects? That's what we need to get better about. And I think what we've come to is the, the realization that the two probably most important platform sustainability are the government and private sector. So I'm not gonna dwell a lot on government, but I think everyone has in the development community has really now taken on board the concept of the Rome principles, that we have to change this mindset that we as development practitioners have, that country-owned, country-led development is the only way that we're gonna move forward. And we need the governments to really step up to the social compact. Um, creating policy for an enabling environment, which was something that, that Mr. Umanya talked a lot about this morning. That's a critical driver. But also investment in infrastructure, in education, which we just talked about, and in global public goods. And here, particularly for agriculture, research is important. Um, just to show a couple slides in terms of the research, this is what beans would look like in Central America if we had not been investing in breeding for beans that are resistant to viruses. This is an old slide. This is a problem we've been dealing with for 40 years. It's a problem we will still be dealing with 40 years from now. This is not going away. So that continual investment to keep one step ahead of evolution um, with respect to the pest and disease loads. Then there are the new challenges. I do not need to say anything to this room about coffee rust and how horrendous that has been in the last three or four years, not just in terms of the productivity, but the displacement of labor between 10 and 20%. That's a new surprise that needs a response, a national response. 
This is a slide actually I took from the work we were doing at the Gates Foundation in Sub-Saharan Africa because I liked the visual. This is what maize looks like under extreme drought conditions. You essentially aren't producing. These are the new lines that are now going out, 140 new varieties in 13 countries on over more than a million hectares, benefiting three million households, very much driven by private sector seed companies. But the varieties were put out with public funding, public breeding, public investment. So it's really important that we find a way to continue investing. IFRI puts out an index, which they call ASTI, the Ag Science and Technology Indicators. And what it shows is how many ag researchers, the full-time equivalents, and how much ag spending the countries have. Uh, El Salvador is not in this index, I'm not sure why, but I pulled the numbers from Honduras, Guatemala, Costa Rica, and as a comparator, Mexico. And so, you know, obviously what you see here is a two order of magnitude difference in the ag spending in Honduras and in Mexico. And what this 2016 report is concluding is that the countries with the smaller ag systems are really, really falling behind in terms of investment in infrastructure, human capacity, our intellectual asset, and the financial assets going into ag. So in terms of conversation, I mean, this meeting is very impressive in terms of the government representatives we have. I would love to have the discussion before we leave tomorrow about how we, the development community, the broader community, works as your ally, because part of this is about building the evidence base and the business case so that you can go to your ministers of finance because that's where the money gets allocated. You know, these are not decisions being made by the ministers of agriculture or the ministry. So what are the data you need? What do you need to convince and persuade them that a viable future for your country depends on more investment in the government sector, in public sector. So if we could have that conversation, I would love to hear what you think would be persuasive arguments that we might be able to work with you on in terms of evidence and arguments. The other platform that we absolutely need, and I don't think anyone would disagree with this, is private sector. Um, I've tried over the last 10 to 15 years, we, we've, again, this is one of those areas where we've been discussing public-private partnerships. I've tried to broker quite a number that have fallen apart. Um, and, and there are two, at least two, what I think are really big reasons why we're struggling. The first reason is romanticism. Um, we're very different sectors, and so public sector comes to the table, and for some reason, we were thinking that private sector was going to put down an awful lot of money to work with us. You know, we were almost looking at this as an income-generating uh, proposition. That was, it's wrong. They don't have money to do that. But conversely, private sector is coming to the table, and for some reason, they believe that public sector is going to eat all of the risk in the collaboration. And I'm saying, I can't take my taxpayer money and subsidize a multinational corporation and buy down your risk. That's not what I'm getting this money for. So, so there's a romanticism that we're both struggling with, and we, we've got to find ways to break through it. The other big um, obstacle that we were facing, and I think is breaking down, is getting past social corporate responsibility, corporate social responsibility. This is not a nice to have. This is a must do. And if you're setting up a relationship that is social corporate responsibility, the minute there's any kind of shock in the corporation, it unravels. And I've watched that happen a couple times. So if we talk about what needs to happen, going back to this concept, is that we need to focus on the vulnerable areas, on the smallholder farmers. AID is saying, well, we need to start thinking about what they're calling inclusive businesses. Profitable businesses that integrate the low-income segments into their mainstream business. The activities as consumers, distributors, suppliers, or employees. In other words, inclusive value chains that accrue and create shared value. Now, if we think about this with respect to smallholders, one way, one way to go at this is through the staple crops. 
I have never, ever worked with smallholder farmers and communities that are okay if their staple crops are not okay. It is their cornerstone. It is their food security. If they're not okay there, you know, it's very difficult to, to, to launch something like this. You're starting to see some of this in maize in Central America. And this was the approach that we actually took at the International Potato Center. And I wanted to share um, a little bit of that story with you. When I went in as director in 2003, we got together with a social science group in the country called GRADE, and we did the mapping that we needed to do. This is the map, or was the map, of extreme poverty in Peru. 80% of those extreme poverty pockets overlap with potato production in the highlands of Peru. So then what we did is SIP, because we had convening power, is we actually convened from those poverty pockets, the smallholder farmers, and the other actors along the value chain. So we had the farmers, we had government, we had private sector, we had some in very innovative components. We brought in the culinary schools, the NGOs, the uh, tourist schools, and so we had really interesting meetings and asked them, what do you want to work on together? You decide. And what they said is, well, we want to work on the native potatoes. These, these are native potatoes from the highlands of the Andes. They're really, really incredible potatoes. And what resulted from that was a whole series of new products that started going into the urban marketplace. The most iconic of those were these. These are potato chips made from native potatoes. Now, what's interesting about this story is that in 2003, actually, because they said, well, why don't we do this, SIP invented those potato chips. But that wasn't our business. So the idea was really neat, and the product was really bad. Um, what happened, because the idea was compelling, is that we had a lot of small national business then get involved with creative imitations. There was a five-year period here, and in that period, one of the things I think we were doing a little bit unwittingly, was de-risking this space for private sector. So we were convening these groups that didn't know how to work with each other, helping them build trust and respect. We were working with the smallholder farmers. We were teaching them business school. We were running business schools, teaching them economic skills that they needed to transform themselves from subsistence farmers to entrepreneurs. We were teaching negotiation skills because they needed to start negotiating with private sector and other actors on the value chain. And we were working with government. Government was setting some really important policy, and we were working with them to change the image of native potatoes. When we started this work, the urban population looked at those potatoes and they thought, this is peasant food and pig food. They didn't want to eat this. And we very slowly, that's why we were bringing in cordon bleu, the most famous chefs in the country, Gaston. We were bringing in the tourist bureaus. We were really working on this. And, and so what happened is after that de-risking, after it became clear this was going to work, you had the big multinationals come in. In 2008, Frito, PepsiCo Frito-Lay launched its Lay's Andinas potato chips, and the Gloria Company launched its brand, Mr. Chips. You can see the market sale went exponential. And we actually created a certification pro project which said you can put your label on your product if you're buying these from smallholder farmers and if there's gap involved, if you're paying the money to train them for good agricultural practices. So it's been a tremendously successful and interesting experience. For the smallholder farmers, what it did is once they understood that there was a secure, reliable market, they quadrupled their productivity in five years. They knew what they needed to eat. Now that there was a secure opportunity, they knew what to do to increase their productivity. And because of the marketing, they were getting more money for those potatoes at the gate, uh, 30 to 50 percent more. So a fourfold boost in productivity, 30 to 50 percent bump in, in prices, it was very, very successful. Another, so this is what you have today. This says, potato, the passion that feeds. That's what the supermarkets in Lima and Quito and Bolivia look like. So it's gone from being peasant food to pride of nation. 
Um, and and that, that's a pretty incredible 10-year experience. Um, another way to go, of course, is to move into diversification with high-value crops. This is what I saw with beans in Central America. Again, the farmers know what they need to feed their family for a year. If we can get productivity up, then they have, in this case, they didn't take the surplus, surplus to market. What they did is they shrunk down the land area where they were planting beans, and it gave them more land to diversify into tomatoes and peppers and onions, etc. So it was basically reallocating their assets. This is hard because it's riskier. These products are perishable. They have pest and disease loads that smallholder farmers aren't necessarily used to and don't know how to manage. You need great technical assistance for this. And it also is subject, some of these crops, cacao and bananas particularly, to um, international price shocks. So this space is riskier, but it's actually really important. This is also a space that we need to work much, much harder for women and youth. And my example here is Lo Rocco. Um, when we were working, lo ro pollo con salsa de Lo Rocco, no? Papusos de Lo Rocco. When, when we were working in El Salvador, this is a flower that is, um, oops, sorry. This is, an, this is Mayan tradition, this flower. And, and basically, it's grown by women. Um, when we were working on the, the bean project in Central America, it was a mixed system where beans were anchoring, the diversified crops were usually potatoes and, and peppers, but we intentionally developed a work package on Oroco for the women. It's grown very intensively on trellises in a small area. It's indeterminate growth, so you can pick it throughout the year when it flowers, it's light so they can carry it to market, and it's very high value. It is the ultimate woman's crop. So thinking more proactively about, you know, what can we do to guarantee that women have a space in these value chains? So, so really, the, the challenge here, in my opinion, is getting private sector to really partner with us in inclusive value chains, where you have small, oops, sorry, where you have smallholder farmers embedded, specifically some value chains that will work for women, um, and youth finding opportunities for decent employment and pay along this value chain. I really think that's a huge part of the future going forward, but it needs to be very intentional. It is hard work, and it is not work that happens overnight. The last area I want to talk about, just to close, is accountability. This is another area where we have struggled as an international development community. We have not done a good job of creating monitoring and evaluation programs, um, results frameworks, accountability frameworks, impact studies, and it's very difficult to make progress when you aren't measuring things and you don't know how it's going. We make so many assumptions that, boy, if we just get this good variety out, the world is going to get better. And as you said this morning, well, it hasn't, has it? So, so there's something that we're not doing right. Uh, for that reason, I was very excited again under the new Feed the Future program that part of what they did in 2010 was to launch a results framework. This is really, really a big deal. The high line development goals are reduction of poverty and reduction of childhood stunting. And then you've got a series of outputs and outcomes that are leading to that. And the wonderful thing is because we accept country-owned, country-led, they look different. This is not a recipe. This is basically developed together with each of the countries. And this fall, we're going to get the first progress report out. So we will have the indicators, the uh, outputs, outcomes, and impacts for all 19 countries for this first five years of work. Now, what is exciting about this to me is we've set aspirational goals as well. We've said we intend to reduce poverty and stunting each by 20%. So now what you have essentially through this framework in each country is you have impact pathway, a theory. You have a working hypothesis that says if we invest here, and this is not just so, in, in those zones of influence, we're 
we're, we're targeting 1.5 million people in Guatemala and 1.5 million people in Honduras. But this is not about looking at the benefits for those direct beneficiaries. This is the other important innovation. They're saying, if we invest our money and we know what we're doing, then what we should see is we should see the needle move. We should see it reduce poverty by 20%, reduce childhood stunting by 20%, and this gives us a huge opportunity, in the zone, in the whole zone, this gives us a huge opportunity for a social learning agenda which is the other thing that we as a development community have been miserable at. We have not had goals, targets, indicators, structures in place to learn. If we don't hit that 20%, why? What did we not understand well enough? What do we need to change? How do we need to redirect? I've looked at some of the preliminary data and in some cases we're superseding our goals. And equally, you want to say, well, why? What happened there? Because I want to package that and scale it out. So, so this is really a huge step forward. It's, it's a big deal. And it's going to be very exciting this fall to see where we're at. But I think the next step is, is to come together. That's the example of AID. You know that we're now living in a new framework of the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, it would be very easy to get lost amongst 17 goals and 169 indicators. And that's, the, that's what I'm worried about. So th there's a group that's come together from the UN agencies, FAO, IFAD World Food Program, uh, USAID, the Gates Foundation, OECD, um, and they're really asking the question, can we pull together our results frameworks? Can we harmonize this? Because the other risk we have is going into Guatemala or Honduras or wherever, you know, as a development community with the governments, we're gonna tear people in 15 different directions if we don't get our act together. So I, I think this is not gonna be easy, but I think it's the next big step. So really that's what I wanted to share with you this morning. I, I think part of the job we have to get better is the targeting, identifying those sub-national vulnerable areas, focusing on reducing childhood stunting, getting decent employment for young people to keep them productive and creative and innovating in the rural space, empower women, work with government to help them increase their investments and their policies that are relevant to agriculture, get them to step up get private sector to step out and become more conclusive. And all of us need to hold ourselves much more accountable and continue learning to get better and to get smarter around this business we call development. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Uh, there's a microphone actually at the middle of the room, so you don't have to walk all the way up here, or you can come all the way up here if you choose. Y se puede preguntar en inglés o español. O comentarios. I have a question. It's lunch. Okay. Yeah. I, I have a question. Um, you said very well, and I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, many things you said, of course, but uh, one that struck me is this idea of how to better integrate uh, smallholder farmers into, into a business framework, because we find that in some countries, the government wants to focus on providing economic incentives for big companies, uh, leaving the smallholders behind in other countries, they, they try to focus only on the smallholders, and smallholders can't produce enough maize and so forth to really compete in the marketplace. So, so what have you seen as far as strategies that may help put those two together? Absolutely. And I mean, as, as one of the things that I had always talked to government officials about, because as a CG center, our mission was very clearly 
poverty alleviation and hunger alleviation, which means we were really needed to do the focusing on, on the vulnerable pockets. And what I would say to them is your, your mission is much broader. I mean, agriculture is not only the driver for smallholder farmers. I mean, you're dealing with the visas and exports. You're dealing with um, food security. I mean, some of the food security moves really it is, as someone said this morning, you know, more efficient to do it on a larger scale. So you're balancing a series of needs that the country has, and that has to become part of the planning. In, in um, Peru, the work that was done on the coast, I mean, coastal Peru, the agriculture, is, is really all high, a lot of it is high value export. And so what the government was doing there was really negotiating really effective free trade agreements. They are the largest exporter of, of asparagus, citrus, all kinds of high value products. And the program, actually, they created a ministry of social inclusion to actually make sure that there was a complementarity to the ministries of ag, education, um, they have a ministry of women, and, and so they were working together to make sure that the smallholders were not abandoned. So it's, it's basically the government has a bigger job than this, but too often we're seeing that there isn't focus, and you're not, I think, going to get yourself out of poverty if a huge portion of your society is lagging that far behind. All right. Thank you very much for a very thought-provoking talk. Um, we're almost ready to celebrate 30 years of the Brundtland Commission. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and anybody that has been working on sustainability for so long could probably recite these 17 goals plus another 25. What do you think, in your opinion and in your experience, is that missing secret sauce or ingredient that actually gives traction to many of these efforts, because it's not lack of programs, visions, initiatives, everything. It's um, much more profound than that. So similar to a question I asked this morning, if, if you were to give a scale of one to 10, any number, I would not ask why. I would ask what's missing to make it a 10. So what would be missing from this to make it happen? Accountability. I mean, we have put, and someone said it this morning, we have put so much money, and we just don't know what's going on. I mean, I will use myself as an example. At SIP, I would stand in front of the board, and I would say, we launched 50 new varieties of potatoes this year, and everybody would clap. Well, actually, they should have been asking me, well, yeah, so where are they? You know, are the smallholder farmers using them? Have they increased their productivity? Have they increased their income? I mean, we're in, we have been so compartmentalized as a community. There are historical reasons for this, but we've got to get over it. We're, we're not thinking from research all the way through to the field. And we're not holding it. Because we've been so compartmentalized, it's too easy to say, well, that's their job. It's not my job. And, and so we've got to change that. And I think that's what these accountability frameworks are going to help us do. We've got to measure and we've got to own up. Are we actually moving the needle or are we not? And learning from that because we don't have the luxury of time or people or money to keep actually repeating and not moving forward. We're, we're spinning our wheels and in some places, as you rightly said this morning, we're sliding backwards. So if I had to pick one of those, I would say accountability across the board. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morano. Yes. Dr. Anderson. Uh, excuse tardes. me. Somebody asked, how do you oh. say how do you say accountability in Spanish? Rendición de cuentas. Rendición de cuentas. That's Rendición very good. Rendición de cuentas. <laughs> Now, buenas tardes, Dr. Anderson. Buenas Dr. Tardes. Murano. Uh, my name is Gustavo Hernández. I'm country director of Hefer in Guatemala. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, I work in development 30 years. I like the things that you emphasize. I think that for chronic malnutrition is important also animal production because the families need to consume more animal protein. Uh, in the case of Guatemala, uh, we have uh, close or more than one million Guatemalans living in here in the United States and they send 
six billion dollars a year in remittances. So that quantity is very important. What do you think about what we could do with the people, uh, Guatemala, Honduras, Salvador, and other countries living in here because they represent a very important economical activity population that support the high levels of needs in these countries. What we could do is something that we are thinking always. Thank you. It's a really interesting question because it really is a part of the resource that we allude to and don't really try and strategize around. I, when, when I started working in El Salvador, we were driving around the countryside and I kept seeing houses with pictures on the front gate. And I'm going, ooh, these are people that got lost during the difficult period. And finally, I got up the courage to ask about the pictures, and it wasn't. It was their family member that was in the U.S. sending home remisas. And, and you know, they were actually paying tribute. And, and one of the reasons why is as you looked at the diversification, one of the problems of moving from beans into tomatoes, tomatoes is what I was looking at, the economics didn't make any sense to me. It's like, this is so capital intensive. Where are they getting this money from? It was the remisas from their family members abroad. And that's what capitalized them to go into that diversification. So, I mean, that's not the only thing. So they were getting their startup loans from their family members. And, and if you were to think about things like that, I mean, Heifer has a program, doesn't it, where actually, you know, you start buying livestock because this is the other thing I see particularly with women, especially I saw it in Africa, that the minute they get their surplus up in maize in particular and they sell into the market, one of the first things they start investing in is small animals. Because as you said, it's a health issue and you're absolutely right. It's also their bank account. And so there's all kinds of benefits and it, it's a risk mitigator. So I mean, it, but as someone said this morning, you know, these are local solutions. I think that's the other big thing we have learned. There are not recipes. You can talk about generalities, but it's about targeting. It's about understanding what is the food and production system in those areas. You know, how would that transform? And, and then you can start making some decisions about where that capital would be best placed and most productive. I, I don't think there are general recipes. Livestock, however, is very important. I have to tell you a story. We had a meeting last year with Bill Gates, and he just leaned back in his chair and said, if I had a truckload of money, as if he didn't, um, I would put it all into basically um, dairy and livestock for smallholders because what we're seeing in terms of evidence is it is so impactful. Um, Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you for, for your presentation. It was really an uh, eye-opener. Um, in terms of gender, I just want to emphasize the importance of, of women in agriculture. Uh, in our case, we, you know, we have seen the difference. And now you know, we have learned that any dollar that a lady, a woman, earns go to the family, yeah. to the improvement of the family. Yeah. And it's not, it's not the same case when, when men are the ones handling the, the income. So I, you know, I, I would like to, to receive more ideas. And, and you know, we, we live in a macho society in Latin America. And we, we would like to hear more ideas on how to uh, empower women in the process because we have seen the difference. When, you know, I'm, I'm coming from the private sector and when you're working in the private sector, you don't, you don't feel that. But now, you know, uh, in, in, in being uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and working in the field, you, you see the difference when, when uh, small uh, cajas rurales are managed by women. I mean, they pay on time, they manage the numbers uh, very good, and uh, they really, uh, make the difference in a community. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think, uh, thank you for saying that. I, I think there's a lot of influence you can have in terms of political will and just saying, we're going to do this and starting the dialogues to ask them. Um, one of the hysterical stories from, in, in Lima, in, in, at SIP, one of the poverty pockets we were working on was around Lake Titicaca. 
and, and we were really taking a multiple value chain approach because they didn't just live on potatoes. So we were looking at diverse value chains and the one that got identified for women was uh, producing alpaca clothing. Now the funny part of the story was they were exporting to Europe, but we introduced computers into the community and I went up there once and all these ladies were sitting around the computers and I went over to see what they were doing. They were watching fashion shows in Europe and they used that to go back and redesign the clothes that they were making to export to Europe. I mean, there's a lot of creativity and, and, and entrepreneurship there if you just help with the leg up. Thank you.